computer. Um, and I'm gonna. So hello again. It's been a while. Good to see you all again at once. Um, I wanted to preface this first of all, but there's gonna be a couple pieces to this. But um, our main focus today is going to be cultural competency and um, building some background. And when you're thinking Sai up and you're thinking Marzano, when you want to build background, usually we're thinking about our students. But today. We are going to build your background. We are going to focus predominantly on several lesser known <coughs> refugee groups that we have got in this school today. Um, so this is, I'm doing it on Prezi. So I always try, if you've never heard of Prezi, I'm sure some of you have, maybe some of you have not. It's very easy to use. I always try and put things into my presentations that you could just take and use. So. Um, they're kind of fun to throw in every once in a while. Kids love them because, as you can see, they move around, or you will see. So I picked a, um, a world template, and you're going to see that as we go through um, each country that we talk about, we're going to actually zoom into that place, and we're going to cover <laughs> several continents today because that's the type of school we have here at Hyatt, which is really cool, is that our student body covers several continents. So um, let's get started. Quinn. No, I haven't sent it out yet, but I will. Okay. Um, so, all right, learning targets and language targets. So today's learning target is I can understand the diverse backgrounds of the student population at Hyatt and apply what I have learned to my classroom instruction. And then um, I've got a couple language targets for you, which um, if you've been PSYOP trained, you know that's a big piece of that. So. Um, Two of them today, I can verbally, so this is what you will be doing today, I can verbally summarize each segment about the cultures of our school with a peer, and I can discuss with a peer how diverse cultures will affect my teaching. All right. Um, so moving on, why are, why are we doing this PD? And um, well, it's kind of a complicated answer to that. The simple answer is that I got a couple requests from staff, and um, this week, it really dawned on me. This, this could not have happened in a more perfect week because as I'm talking to teachers in classrooms, I'm seeing we are starting to see issues come up with kids from these places that you perhaps did not see in September and even in October. There are different behaviors happening. Why is that happening? I can tell you another simple answer. It's because they have now realized that what you're doing in the front and that English and language that they have to acquire is far more difficult than acquiring bad behavior from their shoulder partner and the people around them. So that's what they're using to try and acculturate and fit into what we've got in this environment is, well, that's easy. Poking this guy and making everybody laugh is way easier than trying to figure out what photosynthesis is. So that's what's starting to happen. And so I think this has come to us at a very, very good time. Um, and I also just wanted to say, um, well, you know what? I'm going to say that later. Let's talk about empathy first. The word empathy, not the same as sympathy. Talk to your shoulder partner about what empathy means to you. Go. So let's hear it. What did you talk about? What is it? now? Of course, yes, it's on the board in pink. But I want to hear what. Uh, here's the one thing about Prezi: you can't cover things up with other things, or else the pink would have picked up. But tell me, what did you talk about with your colleagues? What is empathy to you? Anybody? Yeah, Julie. Exactly. Very good. Anybody else talk about something a little different or put it in a different way? Empathy. Different from sympathy. When you think of sympathy, um, it's feeling sorry for someone, right? You feel sorry for them. That is not necessarily what we are asking you for do for these kids. What we are asking you to do is to show empathy, which is the ability to understand and share the feeling. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to dig into these cultures and these places and these ethnicities that we don't know so much about. They're not up on the headlines on CNN. And we're going to figure out 
What does this mean for our classroom? You've got a kid from here who's got a background that is starkly different than what you are trying to teach them. How do you scaffold and give them what they need to be successful? What background do they even have? Well, we're gonna figure that out today. Um, I gotta tell you, I have spent hours and hours for about a month and a half now um, researching, doing interviews. I mean, these are, I've done these interviews, I was, I kind of started this project in Waterloo. Um, I was very close with the Burmese population there, um, kind of with the Chin group, and we'll talk about what that means. And so then I came here two months ago, and it's been hard for me to leave them. It's been hard for them, for me to be here. Every time I'm back in Waterloo, I always go over there. But um, so for me, it's very important. I have to dig in and figure out exactly who are these people, where did they come from, what is happening in Burma that they are here. And um, there was a moment in my teaching career where that really dawned upon me how important it was that I educated myself. And for me, um, that was what I used to, so for four years I taught um, nighttime ELL classes to adults um, at Hawkeye Community College two nights a week, so for four years, among other teaching, you know, I was teaching during the day in London public schools, but at night I was at Hawkeye. And so I remember my first month or two months there, I had come up with what I thought was this brilliant activity. You know, I was a first year teacher, <laughs> I, I was like, they're gonna, I'm gonna write a textbook, this is amazing, I'm gonna put this in, they're gonna hire me, everybody's gonna want me to come speak at their schools, I am amazing, <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> I was like, all right, and my group, I had a lot of um, Korean, we have Korean in the school, which is an, uh, an ethnicity in, in Burma. And um, they are typically a very, and they'll tell you, a playful group. They like jokes, they like to laugh. Um, they're, they're just fun to hang around. I can't really put it any other way. That's their culture, it's who they are. And you know, in class, they, they were always participating and loved being there. And that night, okay, here comes my great activity. I was like, the Burmese, the Karini, they're gonna carry this one. This is so awesome. And it just fell flat. And I realized very quickly it was because my Karini were just down and out. And I thought, what in the heck? I have the greatest activity ever. <laughs> why was why is this happening? They just kind of sat there. They were like the, the mood was ruined. My students from Mexico, from El Salvador, Guatemala, from Africa, they were like, well, they're okay. It's obviously not great if they're, you know, because they were like leaders. So I go home that night, and how selfish of me. I was why were they not involved? Like, I even thought, this is their fault. This was great. Boy, did I get hit in the face the next day because I got an email from my boss that had said there was a fire in the refugee camp that they came from. They had friends and family members die that day. Die. And I was so selfish to think that it was me, my fault, blame it on that. And I just, you know, here I was, angry that they weren't participating in my activity when I should have been commending them for being at English class that night. And it was from that moment on where I had become so passionate about this and about the minorities in Iowa, in Waterloo, in Denver, in Des Moines, and I try and, and be more active and educate myself and help you guys so you don't have to go home and do all this research. I can give it to you. You can ask me these questions because I've got it all here. So um, for me, that was like, I have to know these things because this is directly a my classroom. So I'm going to help you do that today in this PD. Um, so we're going to build our own background knowledge about these kids, about these places. You're going to learn so much today. And you're going to think, oh my gosh, wait, how am I ever supposed to keep all of these groups and ethnicities together? Well, I'm going to send you this and you can look. And just Google. I mean, it's out there. CNN doesn't put it up in their headlines for a lot of these places, but you can find it. Trust me, I'm looking at it every night. <laughs> um, how do we differentiate our, te our teaching for these kids? I mean, it's already tough to differentiate. Now you've got a kid from Somalia, a Kunano kid from Eritrea, you've got a kid from Mexico, you've got a kid from El Salvador. I mean, now you've got all these different backgrounds. How do you tap into all of those schemas and teach content that is just nothing like they've ever experienced before? We can talk about that. Probably not so much today, but when we do one-on-ones, we can talk, or through email, just catch me. I'll, I'll always come help you with that. And then, um, just to get a better grasp on students' experiences, and to become a global citizen. <coughs> These are people that live in our neighborhoods, friends with our children. We need to know about them. They live here. They're not going anywhere. They're here to stay. And we need to figure out who they are so we can help them acculturate into this community that we have here. So, 
Uh, now I need to go over a few things um, before we start. This is a focus on the highest student population. I scoured through PLL documents and um, tried to figure out who do we have here? Where are all these kids from? And it goes so much more than just which country, what country they're from. You're going to see that soon. Um, but there's a lot of gaps. Um, and that's not to anybody's fault, but because it's like there's just some communication. The families don't always give all the information that they need to when they first get here as newcomers. So there are gaps. There's gaps in Infinite Campus. There's gaps in the ELL documents we've got. But I did the best I could. And I got to tell you, a lot of it was from word of mouth. I would ask students, where's he from? Where's she from? I would ask you guys, where's that student from? Where do they speak? What ethnicity are they from, Eritrea? You know, so there's a lot that goes into it. Um, this is general information. My sources are from various news outlets, um, always respectable ones. And then um, interviews that I conducted throughout the last month or so with Hyatt students and also interviews from some of the um, adults that I used to teach because you get a lot from them too. And before I go any further, I have to thank both um, Julie and Virginia because they were huge pieces of that helping me bring kids in. Um, Julie was there for them because a lot of it was really tough for them to say. So she was there to support that. Virginia helped me pull kids. She helped me with all this technology. So um, shout out to both of them. <laughs> and um, OK, this does not apply to every student. You know, just because you have a kid from Eritrea does not mean they've seen these things, done these things. It doesn't mean that. Every kid is unique, and they have a different story. So that's where it gets into you kind of have to get to know them. Some of these kids are from South Sudan, but have never stepped foot in South Sudan. You have to keep that in mind. But it's still very much, and you will hear, so very much plays a role in their education and in their personal lives, that they are South Sudanese, even though they've never been there in their entire life. Um, some of this is going to be very hard. I don't know any other way to put it. Um, I mean, you know, I, I live in a tiny studio apartment downtown, and I'm reading this stuff in it for the last month, and it's hard. Like, I, I mean, there were nights I just had to put it away and go to bed, because I was like, I can't look at this anymore. So. Um, some of it's going to be hard to hear, but at the same time, I think it's necessary. So just be aware of that when we get into this. Some of what they said was hard to hear. Yes, Julie's on her head. Yeah, let's stop. This is what I could get from you guys, from them. And there's probably more. And you're probably looking at this list and saying, I know kids from more places than that. And if you do, I need you to tell me. Because we need to get um, a decent list compiled of this. Um, and again, it's just hard because families don't always know or say, or for example, the Burmese families, they'll ask them at the newcomer center, where are you from? Thailand. Well, they're not from Thailand. They're Burmese who were born and raised in Thailand because that's where the refugee camp is. So it's kind of hard with some of this. Um, these are the 16 that I could come up with in a month and a half. Um, the blue are countries that we're not going to talk about for several reasons. One, I don't have the time. So I'm going to combine some of them. For example, South Sudan and Sudan are very Ethiopia. Those two are very related. So you're going to kind of get that all at the same time. Um, another reason why I'm not going to talk about some of the blue is because these are the ones you hear about in the news constantly. Iraq, Pakistan, India. We know what's happening there. We, we've got that. The general, general, everyday American knows what's happening in those places. Um, and then, yeah, some of them, it's like there's one kid from there. You think of Coast, Grey Don Moore is from Ivory Coast. Yes, there was a civil war there. They've got their own issues. Um, I think, though, he's just, he, you know, he's one kid, and it, it's kind of the same theme as what's happening in Ethiopia, in Eritrea, so it's kind of connected. So just know, just know right now that Africa is, is not, if a kid is from Africa, there is something terrible happening in that country. Just be aware of that. Or did happen historically, and their parents came, something. Okay, so you see throughout this presentation, you're going to see kids' names and the grade they're in behind it because I wanted to make this personable for you. These are kids that you're seeing every day. Who are they? What grade are they in? So there they are. There's some examples for you. All right. First country is Eritrea. We have got a lot of students from Eritrea. I don't know if you know that. Um, now, I talked about before how you cannot just label these kids Eritrean. He's Eritrean, she's Eritrean, Eritrean, Eritrean. It goes so much deeper than that. In Eritrea, let's take my notes because it's a lot of stats. There are nine major ethnic groups in Eritrea. We have two of them at Hyatt. They're the Tigrinya and they're the Kunama. Okay? 
There at the top, you see a list of kids, Saliagos, Jermia, Agnesis. Um, these are all Ephraim. Those kids in blue, Sali Kenna, they are Kunama. They are Kunama kids. The kids in red, Jordanos, Johannos, Birzov, they are Tigrinya. And let me tell you, does that mean something to them? It 100% does. Okay? They are more than just Eritreans. The Tigrinya actually are an ethnicity that's also in Ethiopia. So when you ask a kid, they're, they're used to saying, I'm from Eritrea now, because that's how we label them. But when they're in Africa, I'm Tigrinya. It doesn't matter which country. It could be Ethiopia. It could be South Sudan. They could be in wherever. Eritrea. That is an ethnicity, and they see themselves as we are a team. I'm not necessarily with that country. Okay, so the main languages in Eritrea, remember I told you there's eight ethnicities, and we talk about that. Typically, they're named for the same thing. Their language and their ethnicity has the same name. So if you're Tigrinya, you speak Tigrinya, and you are Tigrinya. If you're Kunama, like Salihagos, like Jermia Boto, if you are Kunama, you speak Kunama, and you are Kunama. Okay, so the main languages of Eritrea are Tigrinya. That's number one. Arabic is number two, although not many speak it. And number three is English. Very few speak it. Um, these are languages that are accepted at government level. Um, but Tigrinya, a lot of people speak. Most of our kids are Kunama, as I said. But guess what? That is only 2% of the Eritrean population. 2%. But a majority of them here are Kunama. Why does that change things when you think of sociolinguistics and you think of um, sociology in general? They were used to always being kind of kicked around in Eritrea. The uh, Kunama people are sedentary farmers. They kind of hung out here, up in here, along the border of Ethiopia and Eritrea. And they were sedentary farmers. They stayed there. And then all of a sudden, the Ethiopians were like, hey, we lost access to the Red Sea, which is a huge financial burden to them. So what do you think they started to do? crept up. And all of a sudden, the Kunama people were put in a hard place because, well, this is our land. This is where we farm. Now, all of a sudden, we got these Ethiopians here. What's going on? Well, the Ethiopians took the Kunama people and put them in a refugee camp. They didn't listen. They killed them. And um, so they're in refugee camps in Ethiopia. Most of our kids know life in a refugee camp in Ethiopia. Kunama people. Um, so there's only 60 to 100,000 people. Why is it so broad? Well, because they're kind of all over the world now. They're displaced. They lost their homes. They're kind of everywhere. And the sad thing for them is that when the Ethiopians crept up into Kunama territory, the Ethiopians were like, these people, lesser, they're lesser humans to them. Like, what good are these people? They're just throw them in a camp. Now, the Tigrinya people, who are Jordanos, Johannes, and not saying these kids, but this is their group, okay? They kind of reside throughout. They're the majority in Eritrea. This is like 50% of the population, the Tigrinya like 50%, they're the majority. And they saw these Kunama people as like, what? The Ethiopians are there. They must be working together. Oh, traitors. How could they do this to us? They're supposed to be Eritrean. And now they're working with the Ethiopians. Guess where they stuck? The Ethiopians take all these Tigr Tigrinya people, they take all these Kunama people, and put them in the exact same camp with all this tension. What do you think happened? Well, I can tell you what Asaliagos and Jeremia Boda told me what happened. They beat the crap out of them is what they did. The Tigrinya outnumbered them big time. Sticks, rocks, anything they could throw them. Asali told me a story about how he and his aunt, they had a school at the refugee camp, and he and his aunt and some other his friends spent a lot of time cleaning it up and making it look good because it was crap. I mean, that, I mean, what kind of education do you get in a refugee camp? It was not a very good school, so um, they cleaned it up. Well, the Tigrinya caught wind of this, and they went that, destroyed it, just flattened it. So this is the kind of life that they lived in Tigrinya, in the camps in Ethiopia. So it wasn't easy, and it's been a hard transition for them here, I can tell you that. If you're seeing behaviors, here's why, or could be a reason why. Because there, if they messed up, they were getting slapped, they were getting kicked by their teachers, they were getting, <laughs> Saliagos told me that they would take this pencil and they would squeeze it in their fingers and it would like crunch their fingers. And he said, they don't do that here, do they? I said. No, they don't. So guess what that means? All of a sudden, you see these behaviors coming up. Well, there's an answer for you for that. Okay, so um, about 1,200. <laughs> yeah, no, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that here. Not okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so there's about 1,200 Kunama in the U.S. 
I'm going to give this to you, this whole presentation. Please click on the culture part if you want to learn anything about those specific cultures. And now I have a question for you. Is there something from this information you will keep in mind when teaching a child from this cultural and linguistic background? What is it? And how might your teaching be affected? Now, with all this new information you've got, nine ethnicities there. Kunama, Trigina, Tigrinya are the two we've got here. Tigrinya were always the dominant. They come here now, and I was talking to Bizarf, and she's like, yeah, used to be surrounded by Tigrinya. Here, it's like Americans and Kunama. <laughs> so it's a whole different, uh, it's a whole different ball game for them. It's been hard for them to adjust as well. So talk with your groups. What, what does this mean for your classroom? Okay, go ahead. Yes. Yes, although, I'll talk about that then. Um, this quote, you'll get to talk a lot, I promise, and we'll talk, there's going to be a lot of buzz about all this, I think, when this is over, but, okay, I want to read you a quote from Asali Kenna, okay, Asali Kenna is an eighth grader, um, I think he got here in the last year, right, Celeste, I think, last year, okay, so this is a, this is a quote from Asali Kenna, <clears throat> if you want to go to the bathroom, they always say no. My grandma is there. It's kind of all over the place. It's a quote. We don't listen. We fought every day. We throw rocks. Tigrinya are Ara and Arabs, and Tigrinya are Arabs, and they hit us because we moved to Ethiopia because we were fighting every day. In America, mostly we friends. We play. Some Tigrinya, Tigrinya here, sometimes they hang out with us and they play with us. Other kids, they still say, why you guys move here? Go back to your country. We was like, we don't care. The bad Tigrinyas, they live in the jungle. If you go there, if you want to eat something, they're going to cut you and hit you. We not living in the jungle. The other Tigrinya, they live with us. Ethiopian people can move, cannot move here because they don't have a card. They moved from, Ethiopia, from Eritrea to Ethiopia. We learned Tigrinya. When we was came here, we forgot to speak. In other words, he doesn't speak Tigrinya anymore. So um, that's just one snippet. And actually, Asali and Jeremia gave me, I mean, they were just like whoa, floodgates. Out they came, and out came all this information with it. Asaliagos, we got whooped by the teachers. If you're late, they're going to be like this and hit you on your hand with the pencil they're going to squeeze if you're late or get in trouble. If you want to go somewhere, you have to have your ID card. If you don't have that, you go to jail and you pay money, like my aunt. Our school, we cleaned it up. If you go there, they're going to hit you. We cleaned up our school, and they came and messed up our school. So this is their experiences. This is some of the things that they know. So I've got more quotes from more kids. If you're interested in hearing, I can certainly tell you. Okay, we're moving. Okay, Somalia. We got a lot of Somalis. Here they are. Mohammed Aden, uh, Hassan Hassan, Hamza Hassan, um, Abdi Abshir Ahmed, Abdi Hiram Sharif, and Abdullahi Sharif. Okay, so there are some um, Somali kids that we have in this school. The main language, Somali is different from the other ones we're talking about here today, and here's why. 85% of their country is Somali. There's not an ethnic thing happening there. It's not about, you're this and I'm that. This is a completely different thing. So 85% of the people there are Somali, and they speak Arabic, and they are Muslims. They are Sunni Muslims. We have a large number of Muslims in our school now because we have a large number of Somali among other countries. Okay, why are they here? Drought and famine are number one and number two. Uh, border wars, group wars, they have not had a government since 1991. No government. What does that mean? Complete lawlessness. You can get rid of murder, rape, robbery, you name it. There's nobody there to hold you accountable for anything. Um, which has then allowed for this group called the Al-Shabaab to come in. Al-Shabaab means the youth in, um, in Arabic. It is a group, a large group of young militants who have come together in the name of extremist Islam. And um, they have just turned the city upside down. 
and these poor Somalis are in the middle of it. Now, if you look at this map, um, and I know you can't read this, so I'm going to show you. The purple are kind of the people who are like, we need a government. Give us a government. And Ethiopia is trying to help them do that. So please, we need a government here. We need some sort of law. Okay? The Al-Shabaab, which is this group who is just causing, I mean, I mean, just, I read yeah, last night, just last week, they killed 15 people in a car bomb in, um, in uh, Mogadishu, which is the uh, capital. Some of them were very important people. And um, so they're in the blue. They were in the bigger cities, but the um, African Union, which is essential for what's happening in Africa right now, had, came in and kind of took them back out. So they're like, we got to do something about this. They cannot have the big cities, and they got them out of there, which is good. So they're kind of, this group is in the rural area just causing absolute havoc. Okay? Um, so what does that do? You've got no government. You've got this militant group out just killing civilians and people. If, they, you know, if you're not uh, this type of person, we're going to kill you. Know, and so what happened is you've got this big rush to the refugee camps. And um, along with that, there hasn't been rain in like two years. And there's no food. So um, there's a huge, huge issue there. 400,000 Somalis have died and 45%. 45%, almost half, is displaced. They are no longer there. They are somewhere else in the world, some of them being here in Hyatt. Um, many Somalis deal with major PTSD, especially if they had any association with the Al-Shabaab. Uh, refugee camp life was also not easy for these people. You should never do this, but if you wanted to rank Difficulty in refugee life in the camp, these guys right down there for, for the toughest. There's no food, there's no water, there's no medicine. Um, it's very, very hard for them to, to just survive right now. So um, we've got a number of these kids. A lot of our kids here were born into the refugee camp, some of them not. Some of them remember life in Somalia. Um, I interviewed a couple of Somalis. And uh, again, you can look at the culture there, that culture piece on the bottom. But here's my, now I'm going to give you a scenario instead of a discussion. Here's your scenario. Okay, a student in your class makes this comment because, unfortunately, in the United States, we have associated any sort of violence with ISIS, whatever, you know, we think, oh, they're all, and that is absolutely not the case. They are good people. I have many Muslim friends. They are wonderful, wonderful people. So what do you do if you hear this comment in class and I put it up here because I've heard it before numerous times in classrooms. Not here. Not here. In Waterloo. But, um, okay, so what do you do? All Muslims are terrorists. They only want to kill people and force their religion. Some kid just, bleh, that comes out. And you've got Somalis sitting in there who are like, I talked to Nita, and she said, um, you know, I like being in America. It's great. Um, it's tough to find friends, though, because um, her religion is so important to her. And a very good friend of hers was, help me with the name, Hag, 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 who is now gone. Okay, they were like besties. Were they from the same country? No. Uh, Nita was Somali, and I believe she was, where was she from? Eritrea. Eritrea, okay. So they found friendship in their like religion. That's where they found common ground and were very good friends. And now she is gone. So if you see Nita, just keep that in mind, that her best friend is now gone, who she found common place with. Okay? So what do you do if you hear this in your class and you have got Somali kids in there who are like, I'm not a bad person. You know? They look hurt. Okay? What do you do? Talk about it with your um, colleagues. Take one answer. Does anybody? What do you say is something like this? I mean, what do you say? Especially if it's an outburst, Virginia. Uh, we talked about using it as like a teachable moment, maybe informing them and talking about how it, 
yes, there are bad Muslims, but there's also good Muslims, just like any other culture. Just like me and you. Yeah. Yeah. Like everybody, I mean, there is always common ground. That's what I try and stress. When you think about trying to tap into schema and build background and things like that, no matter how starkly different um, a country or culture and ethnicity seems to, there's always common ground somewhere. You have to find it and use it. You really do to find out what that is and use it. Maybe it's as simple as soccer. And maybe you don't know a whole lot about soccer, but they love soccer. Then you use soccer. Maybe it's rice. Maybe it comes down to they know a lot about rice. That's what's in. They eat that every day in the camp. Okay, what? can you use with rice in your teaching to try and make that? Yeah, so using it as a teachable moment, maybe have, you know, um, if you have a student who's willing, talk about it. Tell, tell, have the, let them know. Well, I'm Muslim, and this is what it's like for me. And I, this is how it works, and everything's fine, you know? So just educating them, educating them. Um, so moving on from Somalia, we're going into South Sudan. This has been the toughest one for me to read because it is, it is really, really, really bad, unspeakable things I don't even want to say aloud happening in South Sudan. Um, we have a number of them. Well, so let's talk about this first. Again, it goes more, it's beyond the surface. They are not just South, Sud South Sudanese. They are Nuer people and they are Dinka people in this, in this school, okay? They are not just South Sudanese, they are Nuer and they are Dink. Okay, looking at this group of kids, Badi, Kak, Wade, Naimal, Nayanet, Ding. These are all kids from South Sudan. They were not all born there. Again, this is some kids who've never stepped foot in South Sudan. The blue kids are Dinka and the orange kids are Nuer. What does that mean? Here we go. Okay. So the main language in South Sudan, English. Some of them can speak some English. It's a national language, although many people cannot speak it. Um, the Dinka population in the Nuer, this is something that is comparable to what happened in Rwanda, except it's happening right now. Okay? The Dinka people are 35.8% of the South Sudanese population. The Nuer people are 15.6%. Okay? Um, there are other... There's 60 more. You know, this is, we're talking again, 60 ethnicities. And they see themselves as starkly, starkly different from one another. So when you say, oh, South Sudan, you're from South Sudan, cool. Be South Sudan. No, ask them, what's it like being a Nuer or a Dinka? Here's how I always go about it. I don't ask them, what are you, Dinka or Nuer? I say, what language do you speak? Nuer? Ah, okay. That's right there. Because remember, language, a lot of times the language and the ethnicity are going to be the same thing, okay, in Africa. Many, many times. Not always, but many times. Okay. So, um, 60 other ones in addition to what you see here. Many, many ethnicities. Here's what happened in Sudan, okay? There was a war there for a long time, okay? South Sudan finally got their independence from Sudan. Huge war, Sudan, South Sudan. Like these, these um, what were the, the, these rebel groups, what you call it. So there's the Sudanese and these rebel groups from the south were always fighting, blah, 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 okay? So then in 2011, they got their, they got their independence. They are South Sudan. They are a nation. They are the youngest nation in this entire world. Things were looking up. It's like, all right, here we go. We're a country. We're going to elect a president. They did. He was dinking. We're going to elect a vice president. Not elect him, sorry. He picked one. He's like, you know what? Out of the sake, for the sake of being a group now, we are, we are from South Sudan, new air vice president. Okay? So you've got a dinka president and a new air vice president. Things are looking good. 2013 comes around, two years after being a nation, and the uh, president, the Dinkin president, blames the Nuer vice president to, he says that he is preparing a coup, which means he's going to take over the country, the Nuer are going to take over, they're going to shut us Dinka out, they want to rule South Sudan, they're going to get rid of us. There has been you know, there wasn't always just this war with Sudan. There were very deep-rooted problems between the Dinka and the Nuer before. Well, now that this came out, okay, the Nuer, like the Dinka people, the Dinka who runs the government, the Dinka who are predominantly the military, think that the Nuer people are trying to take them over. And it has caused absolute chaos and horrendous, unspeakable things to happen there the last two years. Unspeakable. The African Union just last week released a report that has been long awaited by the whole world, except the whole world didn't know, <laughs> but the African Union um, releases this report of what has been happening 
in South Sudan over the last 22 months. And it, this is one night where I had to shut the laptop and just stare at the wall for a while because um, it is absolutely some of the worst and most atrocious things I've ever read. So um, the biggest reason why this is a problem is because, and they'll say it, like I heard it in a video and I think I have the video here. The guy, this, this new air guy was saying, I could die in that war against Sudan. Like, I was fighting for my people. I was fighting for South Sudan. This, this chaos among one another, this is a war against brothers, and it is useless. Families are being absolutely destroyed. You have a Dinka man related, or married to a, a, to a um, new air woman. I mean, horrible things. The woman's brother killed her husband because he was Dinka. I, I, just, if you just read it, you'll, you'll see it. Um, children without parents now because they had two separate, you know, it's just, it's bad. 80% um, of the population is illiterate. Many, many girls do not read. So what does that mean for you in the classroom? Think about that one for a while. Um, and keep it in mind as you're planning. First war, okay, so again, first war is the Sudan. Now it's a civil war, the war between brothers. Um, and I think I've covered it. Famine and, again, no rain. There's no water. There's a huge drought nothing to eat. These people are fleeing. I mean, they see Dinka military come into their villages and into their towns, still now, every day. And they just run. And they'll say, I lost my husband. He's gone. Like, he was right behind me. He's gone now. And they're in the refugee camp, just panting, like breathing, like running from their homes with their children, carrying their children. Um, it's, it's, it's not, it's not good at all. Um, so, I have a video for you. And you're not going to watch all of it, but I think I have some. Maybe I don't. Maybe it's not even going to play. Well, you know what? You can watch it on your own, right? <laughs> I, I don't know what to. Yeah, well, I'm going to send this to you guys too. So <clears throat> take a look at it. Um, I really want to see the Burmese one, though. I do have a Burmese one. Oh, wait. But no sound. Wait. Still no sound. Sorry, I should have checked this. Are these plugged in? <laughs> oh, I had it in the wrong one. That's embarrassing. Bear the <laughs> This is from 2013, it's first starting. Typical refugee camp looks like in Africa. This is one of the UN compounds in Cuba, transformed into a teeming town for refugees. This is the life most of our kids know. People have just started to receive polio and measles immunization. Concerns are rising about the spread of other diseases, and aid agencies that sent out their non essential staff are struggling to cope with the overwhelming needs. What's that? This woman, now a widow, with three children. He was walking when it all started. He tried to run away, but he was caught and killed, she tells us. She never recovered her husband's body. She's still in shock, left to fend for herself, relying on the kindness of others. Many more wait under the punishing sun for supplies. Being handed out here are non-food items, plus essential nutrient-packed products. But as dire as these refugees' situation is, 
There are others who are potentially even more desperate. There are others who are seeking refuge in, in the bush and in other locations, whom we are also trying to reach. The world's youngest nation, just two years old, where after achieving independence, few imagined it would so quickly end up like this. People are understandably very emotional and traumatized by everything that they have been through, so the camp managers have asked us not to conduct any of our interviews amongst the crowds, not even in people's tents or the markets, out of concern that those tensions could be inflamed. Just this space alone now home to some 20,000 refugees. Many live within walking distance, <coughs> and yet are too afraid to go back home, even though the capital has been relatively stable for over a week now. But fear reigns. James Gajak is the de facto community leader here. When we were speaking, you said that your brother went to get water, and then you never saw him. What happened? My brother went back to the house to collect water. I was given a call with his phone. And that call of phone uh, is, they tell you that your brother is dead. We go to see his sister-in-law. She's pregnant and due this month, but James stays behind. <coughs> he says it's too painful for her and the children to see him. He reminds them of the husband and father they no longer have. Okay, so some of our kids, again, were born in this country. They don't know this. Some of them know only refugee life. Some of them don't know that. But let me talk about some of those kids who were born here and what that, what's happening there means to them now. Um, when you think of kids like Ding, like Padit, let me get this right. I've got to make sure I get them. Nope. All right. So, again, the blue are the Dinka. Okay, so this is the government. You know, they're kind of, they have the president. The military is mostly Dinka. The orange are the new air. Um, and I asked, I sat down with um, Sabit, actually, sixth grade Sabit. And he, again, floodgates, out it came, everything. Sabit was born in this country. He was born in the United States. He doesn't know, he's never seen any of that. So I asked, what does that mean for you then? What does that mean that, uh, you know, you're here? And it very much plays a role in this country. Now, the kids that you see in blue, from what I understand from Sabit, um, these kids' fathers are not here. Um, they are very pro Dinka. And the new heir have kind of taken them in because their mother has kind their mothers have sort of suppressed the Dinka. You know what I mean? Because in Des Moines, we have quite a few more new heir. Again, it's kind of that turning of the table like in Eritrea. Um, a number, the new air all of a sudden are more than the Dinka. And so they've kind of taken them in because we're in a new place. Let's start over the Eritrea. The Kunama and the, from Eritrea, the Kunama and the Tigrinya get along pretty well. That's what the kids told me. We play together, we have fun, it's awesome. Okay, the, here in America, they kind of left it. Not so much here. Not so much. Um, if you're Dinka, you kind of suppress it because you're now a minority. And uh, so they've kind of brought them in. They're friends now, they get along. Sabit has told me when there is a birthday party or something, tensions can come up um, between the two groups. They'll be fighting, physical altercations um, based on what's happening in South Sudan. Um, the Nuer vice president came to Kansas City and Sabit and his family went to go see him. And um, Sabit informed me that while he was there, a Dinka man came up and tried to assassinate him. And Sabit was there along with hundreds of other New Air people from Des Moines and Kansas City in the area. So there are still huge tensions. Sabit's got stories. I mean, his mother was a nurse during the, um, let's see, during the Sudanese War. She said <clears throat> that she heard from her family um, that her, her brother was caught by the Dinka forced to put like a snake down his throat, like just terrible things. These are the things that our kids are hearing. Sabit knows the story. I'll tell you the whole thing. So, um, and all of them have very, very similar stories and there's a lot of tension here. Although they're trying, the kids are really trying to get past it. 
They want to be friends with CAC. They want to be friends with Wade. So they're kind of putting it aside and saying, we're here, let's, you know, but it still very much plays a role in their life. Okay, um, so <clears throat> second to last one, Burma, Myanmar. We got a lot of them. Waterloo's got a lot of them. Iowa has a lot of them. Iowa specifically has taken up more Burmese and kids from, or in, sorry, refugees from Myanmar than I think any other, any other state in the entire country. And um, here's something you need to know about Burma. <laughs> There are 135 ethnicities, 135 ethnicities in Burma. There are eight major groups. There are eight major groups. In our school, from what I can see, we've got Korean and we've got Kareni. There could be more. Again, this is word of mouth from the students. I just asked them, what language do you speak? Korean. Anybody speak Kareni? Yeah, people speak Kareni. Who? I type it down. Okay, so the blue are Karen, Muki Pa, Blue So, Christy Pa, A Da, A Potabo, A Tabo. Those are Karen kids. Uh, so May is a Karini kid. Um, here's what's happening in Burma. The government, which is run by the Burman, it gets a little confusing. The Burman, B U R M A N, which is 68% of the population, again, huge majority, are going through and doing a Burmanization of the ethnic groups, of the, of the minority ethnic groups. Um, <clears throat> little history, very quick. Uh, <laughs> in 1952, they got their independence from Britain. Um, Burma did. They were their own, they, and they kind of got to decide, what are we going to do? Because this group, more than any other, has their own traditions, their own cultures. They are very, very different. They cannot understand one another. If you've got so may, Speaking to a potabo, they will not understand each other if they have Karani Karani, not even close, not even close. Two starkly different languages. How do they speak together? Burmese, which is taught in the schools, which was enforced by guess who? The Burman, which is 68%, who controls the government, who controls the military. Okay, <clears throat> so lots and lots of problems here for hundreds and hundreds of years. So they get their independence from, from Britain and, uh, in 1942. The Burman convince all these other little groups, hey, why don't we make one Burma, and after 10 years, you guys can kind of separate out and become your own nations. You'll be the Korean, you'll be the Korean, you'll have your own countries. They were like, we can agree to that. All right, we're one Burma, 10 years though, 10 years. Yeah, 10 years, okay. 10 years goes by, 1952. Did the Burman let them go? No. How did they keep them there? Force. So they are still Burma and do not want to be. And the government is using ugly, ugly methods to keep it Burma and to go through this Burmanization. They are trying to wipe out. There are many people who would argue this is genocide happening in Burma. They are taking the Karin, the Karini, the Shan, the Arkanese, all of these groups, 134 other ethnic groups, and they're trying to completely wipe them out. So um, <clears throat> as you can see, the ethnic minorities are much smaller. You've got a 68% population of Burman where the Shan is 9%. That's the biggest ethnic minority is 9%. The Karin, which is the majority of what we've got here at Hyatt, they are 7%. They're the second largest ethnic group at 7% of the total Burmese population. The Karini, very small. And we have a lot of Karini in Iowa. Haven't seen so many in Des Moines. We've got a lot of Karini in uh, Waterloo. We've got a lot of Chin in Waterloo. We've got a lot of Kachin in Waterloo. Um, so, mostly here in Des Moines, I've seen Corinne, though, there could be more, maybe they're in different parts. They're probably in different parts of the city, because they typically live in the same neighborhood. They live in, like, the same apartment complex, even. It's like a whole Corinne group. You want to visit one kid, you, you're visiting, like, 20. He's like, hey, you, you, live, you live here? Wow, like, your whole class is standing in front of you, because they all live in the same building. Um, so, um, <clears throat> why they're here, the Burmese government has committed horrendous acts against the ethnic nationalities of Burma, so those those subgroups. And even within these groups, the Korean, they're smaller. They're broken down even more. Smaller groups. This group is smaller. And it just goes down. And they just have all of these. <laughs> it's crazy, the diversity there. Um, killings, beatings, torture, forced labor, forced relocation, rape. I mean, kind of same theme. Um, all underneath an umbrella of impunity, which means the government's like, no harm done. Do what you got to do. Burmanization, right? So it's like, you're not getting in trouble. This is what we're trying to do here. We're trying to make... You all Burman. So that's why in the schools, they, that's why they can all speak Burmese. 
Because in their schools, they were forced to learn in Burmese. That's not even their native, native language. They speak Karin natively. They speak Karini natively. So English is their third language. A lot of, for a lot of the African kids, too. Some of the African kids, this is their fourth one. Because they can also speak Arabic. So um, <clears throat> it's a lot to think about with all the languages. They've got swimming around in their head. What does that mean in your classroom? Um, so uh, if you look at this map, this is Burma. You've got China up here, India here, Thailand here. Okay, The Karin state, again, very, they're a very distinct group. They've got their own customs, cultures. They want it to be their own country. They wanted to have nothing to do with them after 10 years, and they're stuck in this place. So they're kind of down here along the border of Thailand, and, um, <clears throat> and that's sort of where they reside, the ones that are left, because there are a slew of them in Thailand, and there are a lot of them here too. They're everywhere. Um, the Burman have kind of the central area, the plains, 68% of the majority, remember. They've got the capital, Yangon. Like Krab Yangoon? Rangoon? Rangoon, sorry, Rangoon, not Yangoon. Yangoon. I can't remember. One of the two. Anyway, so they're here. Um, and then you've got these other little groups kind of around. And the Burman have just, I mean, when you read, this is an amazing link. And if you go on that, you can click into all of the different ethnicities and read up. What did the Burman do to them? What did they do to them? I mean, it's just like a list of this Burmanization. Genocide. People, many, many scholars are arguing this is genocide. So, um, I think that's all I wanted to say about that group, I believe. Was there something else I wanted to say? Some of them um, resided in like, <clears throat> like the mountain people. Like the Chin are mountain people. They're, this is whole, some of them had never seen cars before. This next video is, is really, really um, eye-opening. Yes? Oh, yeah. Um, Cindy and I talked about this. So <clears throat> in Burmese, there's all kinds of little things. I mean, they typically, it's very important that you should ask them what they want to be called. Because many, many times it's the full name. They don't do last names there. They don't do them. So when they came into the country, the American government, you know, we're like obsessed with filling all the blanks. What's your last name? I don't have one. No, what's your last name? I don't know. So they would take that last name and put it in there to fill in the blanks. So on their driver's license and on all these documents, they've got last names even though they don't really have a last name. So sometimes they wouldn't have one at all. They have one name, Bo. I'm Bo. Bo what? Just Bo. Okay. So then they would look at somebody else who came with them in the same group. His name's Ray. Now you're Bo Ray. Okay. So it was like they were given these names. Some of them kind of liked it. They're like, yeah, I'm Bo Ray now. It's kind of cool. <laughs> the Americans call me Bo Ray. I'm Bo Ray. So it's like, um, they, you have to ask them because some of them, that is their whole first name. Mookie Paul, that's his whole first name. Mookie Paul. He does not have a second name. That's it. That, that's his name. Um, some of them Americanized, like Christy Paul. She was probably not Christy Paul in Thailand. I can tell you that right now. Um, so it, their names are a unique situation. Ask them what they want to be called. I don't care if it's November. Ask them. They'll appreciate it. Uh, another piece of information. Um, never touch their heads or anywhere near their heads. In Asian culture, the head is very sacred. And the Burman, because um, there was an, if they needed, they felt like they needed to do something, they would grab them by their heads, which is like the ultimate, ultimate no-no. Um, and if death was the sentence, that's how they would kill them, was chop off their heads. That's the ultimate crime. Um, don't touch their heads. Uh, one of the students told me, <clears throat> I asked him, what is something that you want your Hyatt teachers to know? And he told me, very limited English, and he said, sticks. Julie was in there with me, and, I, and we were like, what does, what sticks, what does that mean? They, anytime you pick up an object that resembles a stick or looks like a stick, your Burmese kids are going to shut down. And it's because they were beat with them on a regular basis in Burma and in the refugee camps. So if you've got a ruler, a metric thing, swinging around, I mean, anything like that, they're done. They're not looking at you. They're down and out for the count. There's no learning happening. Watch the sticks. Be aware. Put them down. Don't even touch them. Okay? Um, that was the first thing he said. He was quiet through the whole interview. And I said, what's one thing you want your teachers to know? Sticks. Okay. Got it. So um, it was new to me, too. I was like, I had no idea. I, I didn't know. 
All right. I picked this video because this is a pure and absolute perfect reflection of what all of our kids went through, all of them. Coming to America, you are going to be amazed. They have, when they're in those refugee camps, they learn they're coming to America. All right, here we go. A lot of them were born there. A lot of our kids only know refugee life. Um, some of their parents were born into the camp. Um, they were there for a very, very long time. Some of them not so long, some of them longer. Um, they have like, and I have been told this before, and you get to see it here. In this refugee camp, you see like stick houses, tarps, tents. And then they have this little section that's like designated for when you're about to go to America. It's like this little room that's made to look like an apartment in the United States, like sitting in the middle of this refugee camp with like dirt and everything. So like they're like learning what an oven is. Many of their mothers never use an oven to cook. They have to cook outside because there's always these fires happening in refugee camps. Um, there's a lot. It's just, it's very interesting. And I'll let you, I actually have to exit out. This, I mean, th this is exactly what they tell me it was like coming here, so. Finally tonight, America <clears throat> is a nation of immigrants. Most of our ancestors came from somewhere else. Maybe that's why the U.S. Department of State accepts more refugees into this country than all the other countries of the earth combined. Seventy-two percent of the people who are resettled as a result of war or persecution are welcomed here. We wanted to show you how, so we asked Seth Doan to catch up with a family that fled the long civil war in Burma in Southeast Asia and arrived in a strange and wonderful place today. The Ali family landed in Syracuse, New York today. Refugees from tropical Burma, they came with no coat, no savings, just an American dream. I'm just hoping for a job, Mohammed told us and a better life for my family. We met the family earlier this month in a refugee camp in Thailand. What is this for? Here they were getting lessons in American life. Do you see any firewood here? Mohammed's wife, Harpa, at an oven. And we have hot water, cool water. In this mock-up of a Western-style home, many things that are routine in America seemed unknown here. Okay, please show me how do you use that. <laughs> Muhammad came to this camp of 47,000 when he was just 15. There are more than a dozen of these camps along the Burma border. Some of them That's where our kids were living for most of their life. for ethnic minorities who fled villages destroyed by Burmese soldiers. When I was in Burma, I was tortured, he told us. Burmese soldiers discriminated against simple people like us. I just could not bear it anymore. Muhammad told us he can't go back to Burma and can't find work in the camp. For him, the only option is to leave for good. Since 2006, around 55,000 Burmese refugees, once living here in Thailand, have been resettled in the United States. 20,000 from this camp alone. The majority of the students have lived here longer than 15 years. Sarah Kaufman works for the International Rescue Committee which helps prepare refugees for the culture shock of life in North America. They learn about employment, finding a job, the education system, U.S. laws, transportation, international travel, a lot of, a lot of different things. In a relatively short period of time. Maximum five days. What they lack in practical skills, Kaufman said, won't prevent them from succeeding. Many have strong family values to take care of their children, they value education. These things will be useful in the United States. I would like to have a better opportunity for my family, Mohammed told us. I hope for a better life and equality. Hello, welcome. Today, he and his family took their first steps toward that American dream. Seth Doan, CBS News, <coughs> Thailand. The United States government usually supports a refugee family like that for about 90 days. And then it's like, good luck. So um, there's a lot of groups here in Iowa, actually, because we have such a huge Burmese population of Burmese that help the, the Burmese. And Bark is the big one. There's other smaller groups. Um, so if you want to ever get involved or your, parent, or your kids to do something on a weekend, um, 
if you think about doing some uh, volunteer work, they, I mean, just basic things that we would have no idea, I mean, they have no idea. I can't tell you how many times I spent getting rid of bed bugs out of these <laughs> complexes, like just things like that, like it's just issues, so many issues that, and, and just unknown information that you can give them, simple, simple things you've known your whole life. So um, keep that in mind as you're teaching these kids. That was their life. That camp was their life. Many of them had never seen a car, let alone they got out and there was snow. That's what one kid said. I looked at the floor. There was snow. There was white in Iowa. I asked what the first, what the first time was like when he came down. I looked at the floor. There was, snow, there was white. It was the first time he seen snow. Anything like that. I mean, so very, very different cultural background. All right. Someone else is taking the reins for this one. So I'm going to step down for a little bit. This is the last one, by the way. I'm going to take the talk about La Salle del Lord because I am from La Salle del Lord. I immigrated here in 1986. And the reason why I moved is very different than why our kids are here today. But it's related. And I'll tell you, I moved here because of the Civil War uh, in the 80s. There was a lot of violence going on. Be on eighth grade.
So our discussion question for you then, um, <clears throat> what can you do, what can you say to a kid from El Salvador who's used to, I mean, that's the culture, that was the culture there. You don't go beyond ninth grade. What do you do as they're teaching here to promote that? Secondary education, high school, even further, trade school, university, whatever. What can you do, what can you say? Talk about it with your friend, peers. <clears throat> A lot. There's so much more, but I try. It's yeah, hard to just to get it. Yes. Yeah. I wonder if it would be important to just in a, in a three sentence thing, like, so you think that you know, the kids are here, like, life in America is awesome, right? And it's awesome when you first get here, but then you see how hard it is to learn the language, and you look around and you see right. everybody else here has what you're not going to have. Right. And so. It's a good point. So. It's a good point. I could probably stick it in somewhere. <clears throat> So, again, these are kids who, I mean, Kimberly and Diego told us. Kimberly and Diego were very honest, and they said, there were days when I just would not go to school. I wouldn't go to school because I had the fear that I was going to get jumped, and they told me they were going to kill my whole family. Um, they said that traffic in El Salvador is out of control right now because they are petrified to have their kids even be standing at the bus, bus stop, to be standing out there, that everybody is driving their kids to school, and you can't get anywhere on the streets because everybody's in a car. Um, there, this is a, there's an, uh, you'll see later there's a link with a great article written by a woman who was just there, American woman, who talked to a lot of El Salvadorian people, worth a read. Okay, so what did you say? What can you tell a kid who thinks, well, in El Salvador I only had to go to ninth grade. Why do I have to go on to high school? What's, in college? What? What do you say to them? Brenda. Awesome. So they can see that a, a lot of our kids, the only thing that smart kids can go to Central Campus, because there's lots of opportunities in Central Campus for them to take classes. So they can see, hey, I'm interested yep. in cars. I can take this class at Central Campus. Yep, that's a great idea. Build some interest. Excellent. All right. So um, that was the last country. I thought I'd show you this. These are all the countries we've talked about today. This is the 2015 list from the Global Peace Index Report. These are the most dangerous countries in the world right now. These are the most dangerous countries to step foot in. Number one, Syria. We hear about that one a lot, don't we? Two, Iraq. Three is Afghanistan. Four, South Sudan. That's the one that we talked about today. Five is Central African Republic. Six is Somalia, one of them we talked about today. Seven is Sudan. We do have kids from Sudan here. I don't know who they are. If you know who they are, let me know. Um, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And you're supposed to call it that whole name, by the way. Tons of them in Waterloo. Haven't seen a one yet in Des Moines. So um, be prepared that they might come here, though. They kind of come in groups. And I heard some rumblings when I was leaving. I said, hey, I'm moving to Des Moines. Hey, we were thinking about moving to Des Moines. <laughs> so and I'm telling you, when a couple families come, they all live together. Here they all come, so be ready. That could be the next group that we see here, the Congolese. Highly, highly educated. Doctors, lawyers, nurses, psychiatrists, who now here, nothing. None of that has transferred. They are back to working in the factories. Doctors and lawyers in the Congo are now working in the factories here in the United States. It's been a huge hit on them, um, on their self-confidence. And, and so that's the Congo. I expect to see them here in the next year, maybe two. Um, as, as well as Syrians. Iowa has said, hey, we're going to take in some Syrians because uh, the United States has, I said, they're going to take 10,000. I think Iowa has said, we'll take in a few. Iowa is very generous in this, just so you know. We are like one of the leading states for taking in refugees. Love it. It's awesome. <clears throat> yeah, a lot, a lot. Uh, They'll be here. When they're coming, they're, they're going to be coming. That's and the have point where we're even uh, projecting numbers as far as our PLL and our class. And they will have major PTSD as well. So, um, probably. 
Pakistan is 9, North Korea is 10, 33 is Myanmar or Burma, 36 is Eritrea, and 40 is El Salvador. Okay? There was 162 countries that they looked at. United States, 66. Okay. Um, this is for you after this. If you want to read some more, I really suggest that Burmese one, and I, this one is hard to read, but if you're willing, South Sudan, that's a tough read. That is extremely informative. That's a good one, too. These are also good, but those are the ones I really recommend. Um, okay, switching gears. Take a deep breath. I'm glad I don't have to read that stuff for a little while. I'm going to take a break. Okay. All right, you've probably heard rumblings, whispers. Since I have the floor, I thought I would use it. Um, teacher to Teacher uh, has been here, and it's coming back. Um, and it's for you. There's nobody looking down your shoulder and anything like that. This is, a, a, take advantage of this. Here's what we're doing. You're going to get to select a peer. We'll talk about the criteria with that. Um, and you're going to select a cycle week before Christmas. We'll talk about what that means. Um, you're going to make a schedule for that week with your peer, a pre-observation, ob an observation time where you go see them, they come see you, and then you get together and you talk about it. You can stay in, I mean, the, there's your time for each of them. It could be more, it could be less. I don't know. It's up to you and how much you have to talk about. Um, we're asking that you complete one full T to T cycle, one um, by Christmas. So whenever, it's like seven weeks to choose from. And then one at some point next semester, whenever. You have five months to choose. So that, that will kind of be the expectation that is just one a semester. Um, and Shannon will be here December 7th. If you'd like to choose that week, she'll be here. She can give you some guidance, help you out. Uh, and keep in mind that, yeah, again, that we'll do one next semester as well. Um, okay, so how are you going to choose your partner? Well, Chris and I sat down a lot. We talked about how are we not going to need subs. So here's what we're doing. Um, you're going to choose somebody from a different grade level than your own, but try for the same content area, because that's the way the master schedule is built, is that you, during your time, can go see them, and that they can come see you, no sub needed. OK? Whatever time. It's not, and it might not be a perfect whole hour, you, however long you think you need. Um, we're going to try and we did a T to T training with the new teachers here about a month or so ago. They, if they haven't already, they will. They might ask you as a veteran teacher to be their peer because that is another um, criteria is that a new teacher needs to be with a veteran teacher. In other words, you've been T to T trained and it wasn't within the last year. Um, so nobody's going to, unless you ask me to be there, I'll be there, but I don't have to be. I mean, you can, I would, if you, I would more, I would come in and we can talk about it, I can help, whatever. Whatever you need me for, I'll be there to do it. But really, um, so you're going to choose a peer, and you're going to email it to me by next Friday. That's the 13th of November. So start talking and making your team, which I'm sure you'll do as soon as you leave here. Um, make a cycle schedule, and um, just email it to me. Which week you're going to pick? I don't need anything more than that. Which week are you going to do? I don't need to know which day's in the week. And then complete the cycle during your chosen week, which is, again, you have this form, and you just kind of ask each other some questions. What do you want me to look at? Oh, I want to look at how well I supported my content. All right, that's what I'll look at. Take some notes. There you go. That's it. Nothing is kept. Nothing. This is just to make Hyatt a self-sustaining. You guys are going to be just going into each other and, and, and just helping each other. That's what this is. You're helping each other to become better teachers. And more so, the person who was observed, you're going to talk through yourself. The person observed you just kind of listening to you. Kind of like a of you who have been in the district, you know that also a state requirement is that you do a peer reflection at least, or peer observation at least one time in the year. So at the end of the year, what I have to do is sign off that all of the staff members have done an individual professional development plan, so that's why we have to do the iffy-diffies 
and that kind of stuff. If you're on cycle, I send that to <coughs> district office and they randomly send to the state department. I also have to send the peer reflection or the peer observation if you're on cycle, but I have to sign off that you've done one any, for anybody who's in the building. That is a different form, okay? However, the state accepts this form. So you have two choices. This teacher-to-teacher -teacher reflection, teacher-to-teacher <coughs> -teacher observation, is absolutely designed to be completely confidential between you and your partner. The peer reflection is not anything that is read by anybody. It's a sign-off that we've done. If there would be an audit, they would come to me and say, I want Wilson and Windsor and Nelson. And I have to go through my files and pull their peer observation. That's the only time that it would be checked. You have an opportunity to, to, to you can do three different things. You can do your first semester T to T, your second semester T to T, and your state required peer observation. <coughs> if you like to do extra things. If you don't like to do extra things, you can make an additional copy of your T to T form, send it to me, and say on the top, please count this as my peer reflection or my peer observation. I can then take this and put it in your file and the state will count that. So if you would like for this to count as your peer observation, just write that across the top, make a photocopy of it, stick it in my box. If you want to keep this confidential, let me know. I will get you a copy of the other form, which actually asks the same type questions. It's just going down instead of in boxes. You can do a third peer-to-peer -peer or teacher-to-teacher -teacher reflection, and you can turn that one in, Jimmy. Okay? Oh, I thought you had to do that. <laughs> okay. I was about to say, I think that's the first time you've ever asked a question. <laughs> Again, and right? I think. Are you going to mail us that paper? I'm going to email it to you. Um, and I just, I have to say that even from this new position I have now, I even on the opposite side of that, I've been in your guys' rooms. I steal stuff all the time from you. It's a good opportunity to see your, your peers teach, learn from them. So there's so many good things that come out of this. So. And here's um, what I don't want you doing. I don't want you waiting until second semester and saying, "Well, I'm going to compare my two T to T reflections and see which one makes me look better." Okay, and I know there are people who are going, well, I really don't want her. This is simply, are you thinking about what's going on? It's not a getcha. The only time it becomes a getcha is if you refuse to do it, and then, then it got you. <laughs> All right, th and now, set third order. Um, so if you have not been PSYOP trained for the six new teachers we've got, um, some of you will be PSYOP trained in the next month, some of you will be PSYOP trained in the summer. Um, and I'm going to start, I've had a lot of people talk to me about, I like PSYOP, it's very connected to Marzano and the framework, so I can show you that. If you just want some ELL help, I am going to start like a book study, I guess. We can come together and talk as professionals. What do you, what do you need to know? What's happening in your classroom? What's happening in your classroom? Let's try this. How, about, how can I build some, bring in a lesson plan. How do I build background here? If you just need some help, I'm going to start some sort of, group, like an ELL support group, um, and we can talk about anything. Maybe it's cultural stuff. Like, I do not know how, I mean, like, like this is so, their background is so different. How do I connect it? I will be there to support you, and I'm going to do it in this way. Um, we're looking into some things. Uh, if we need to, uh, financial stuff, uh, I'm going to look into Heartland AEA to get some credit, perhaps. I've got a number to call, thanks to Julie, who's in the back, by the way. And then uh, we would just, if we ever needed the book, you've already got it. It's that same book that you were trained with. Um, just email me and let me know if you'd be interested. Uh, it could either be like once every two weeks from like 2.45 to 3.15, where we just, again, come together and maybe you don't come every week. Maybe you're just like, okay, this week I need to be here and I need to ask you these questions. But I'm going to be there and I, I'm here to support you. That's my, that's my job, you know. I'm here to help you with all of this. Um, so, let me know if you're interested, but I'm going to be looking into some of these.
Okay. All right. And then I did this because I thought, I didn't want you guys to like throw anything at me or like for the last, but here we go. Yeah? No? <laughs> okay. All right. Now, this is the part that uh, Virginia and I were working on. So... Listen up. You might recognize some of these faces. Okay. 
and talk slow you when know, people talk very soft so that they say um, they inspired me to keep working in class. My teacher is let me do hands on activities that it's gonna do you know that that's that's good that I am here with the good I just want to say thank you to Ms. Lexington, Mr. Pet, and Mr. Burns. I want to say thank you for the, all the teachers that helped me understand the culture of many different religions. I want to say thank you to all the teachers that understand and help me when I don't understand. Thank you, yeah. 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 teachers. They do listen and they do love you. And they're, <laughs> it was really heartwarming to hear all the things they were saying about you guys. So that was really cool. Okay, so with all of the stuff that we heard today, the terrible, terrible things, I thought, let's go to Hawaii. So now you're in Hawaii. But there you go. That's, <laughs> there, we're all in a luau. Just, oh, I know I need to go to Hawaii after this. So, done today. So. All right, I guess, go ahead, yeah. Any questions?